Aloha, and welcome to Live at the Legislature, where each week we talk with members of the Hawaii House Majority discussing bills and issues moving through the House of Representatives. Today we have with us two very qualified representatives, Representative Tina Wildberger, who is from District 11 on Maui, that's Kihei Wailea, Bakena, and Representative Bertrand Kobayashi from District 19, which is Wailai, Kahala, Diamond Head, Kaimuki, and Kapahupu. Welcome to you both, and thank you for being here today. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Um, Representative Wildberger, I'd like to start with you. Um, today is kind of a historic day with inter-island uh, flights being reinstated. Um, there's no more 14-day quarantine. And I wanted to ask you, is, is that too soon? Are we doing this too soon or is it too late or is it just right? What do you think about this new opening of the flights? So for my district with 37% unemployment right now and our inextricably tourism linked dependent economy, um, it can't come soon enough. Uh, Maui is chomping at the bit to get back to business. Um, I am concerned, however, that since we're only lifting 14 day quarantine for inter-island travelers and are still mixing Kama Aina with connecting passengers who have not quarantined yet. Um, every day, the numbers that Hawaii Tourism Authority puts out shows 100 plus connecting passengers who they say who are in transit and haven't left the Oahu airport, but they're getting on planes and mixing with Kama Aina travelers. Mm -hmm. And that's a hole in, our, in the system that we've set up. So uh, I personally am not flying Hawaiian Airlines. Um, I don't feel like it's safe. I'm flying um, Mokulele to get to and from Oahu so that I'm not mixing with mainland connecting passengers. And I feel like this is something that uh, could be better handled by asking Hawaiian Airlines to open up nonstop flights to mainland travelers who can then come and quarantine at their destination rather than mixing Kama Aina people who have been um, staying at home, social distancing, uh, and doing all of the things, all of the sacrifices that we have all worked so hard for to only get on a flight and for a half hour mix with people who might be uh, asymptomatic super spreaders. So you don't want to take that risk. That's why. Yeah, Have... it's. A, I mean, we need to open up, but we um, need to be more targeted. Um, I think that uh, we haven't seen really quite enough leadership in the opening People have been left to their own devices. Um, nursery schools that are trying to open or trying to develop their own protocol, uh, restaurants that are opening, everybody's doing something different. Um, everyone's struggling and working really hard. We need support and we need leadership and we need um, very uh, grounded and definite rules about um, what we're doing as we open up. Um, I'm loath to be hypercritical of people that are trying to do the very best they can to address this situation because it is unprecedented. We've never been through anything like this, right. um, but we really do need strong leadership and we need, to, uh, we, need, we need to plug those holes where we have exposures that are, are going to uh, negate the efforts and sacrifices that we have made already. What's it like on the ground over there? Are, are restaurants opening or are, are tours opening? What, what's going on over there day to day? Opening is very, very limited. Um, most of the business models for our restaurateurs, our tour boat operators are uh, at such a level that they need, they need the numbers. So Kama Aina are never going to be able to offer enough patronage for them to even bother opening. There are tons of businesses that are sitting on PPP money waiting for a real opening to start because nobody wants to try to open, fail, have to close, and then reopen again. So um, there's a restaurant Hui here on Maui that's getting together and trying to address um, their varied interest from <coughs> small restaurant operators, from food trucks, all the way to the major players like Peter Merriman and Bev Gannon and uh, 
Garrett Morero from Maui Brewing. They're, they're all working very closely together. Um, we have a unique challenge on Maui in dealing with our Maui Liquor Commission, which does not operate in the same manner that the Honolulu, Big Island, and Kauai County Liquor Commissions um, operate. They are obstructionist, anti-business, and have not been cooperative in helping these businesses get to a reopening point. Well, that can't help at all. But uh, things do need to be coordinated. You know, if if we're having people fly over and, and services aren't available, it's, it's not going to go well. Uh, yeah, let's hope so they... Here on Maui, um, there are a few re few restaurants are starting to open. And these are, the, these are the, the brave operators that are laying the groundwork, that are finding out what's working, what's not working. Um, we have a few dive operations that are starting to operate. I went diving with Maui Diamond last week and um, was able to go to Molokini without two or 3,000 other tourists in the crater. It was an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. um, but I also went over to the west side last uh, this weekend to dine at Mala, one of um, uh, Mark Elman's several restaurants he's opened one of his outlets and they were doing a very good job in practicing social distancing but driving through front street in lahaina was uh positively post-apocalyptic there are literally boarded up storefronts with with uh plywood nailed right up against their their doors so we're already starting to see the closures of permanent closure of businesses here and the handwriting's on the wall I wrote to the mayor last week and asked him to to uh, put $5 million toward helping the restaurant industry so that we don't lose um, these employers. These, these employers employ thousands and thousands of people on Maui. While they're all separate companies, nobody has, I think, taken into account how many thousands of employees as a pool this industry uh, is, is able to keep working. So if we lose our restaurateurs, we also lose that employment segment. And um, I'm asking the mayor to please put $5 million of his CARES Act funding to support the additional expenses that these restaurateurs are taking on to try to open up under what we're gonna call new normal. I'm extremely concerned uh, that this is going to be a protracted event. We're not going to wash our hands of this, no pun intended, in August. Um, Beijing, I learned today, just this morning, is closing schools because of rising COVID cases. So this, this challenge is going to be with us for, uh, you know, a protracted period, two years. And I think it's important that we um, plan that way and don't pretend like, um, we're not going to be dealing with this in the fall and next year. Yeah, some people seem to think it's over already and they're not wearing their masks. They're not social distancing and that could just make it all go on longer. Well, so what happens with the um, all of the activity on the mainland with Black Lives Matter protests and resurgence of cases uh, in two weeks? Well, Representative Kobayashi, I don't want to ignore you here. We are. Uh, coming up onto another session. And uh, we're about to re reconvene for a second time the 2020 legislative session that was disrupted by the coronavirus. Unfortunately, many bills that we hope to pass this session will not be passed. But what do you think are some of the priorities that we should get through before we end this session in July? Well, the biggest priority, of course, is the budget. and. In May, when we uh, reconvened, we passed what was essentially a placeholder budget with over $600 million in federal funds placed into the state rainy day fund. That was pure placeholder action. And part of the reason for that was that everybody was guessing about what the revenues are. You can't do a budget unless you know both the revenues and the expenditures. And so at that point in May, we had estimates of, of $1.5 billion shortage by the governor estimating and the legislature estimating a $1 billion shortage. Uh, the legislature proved to be correct. Uh, and so we went with that budget as a temporary 
Testament of Revelations. Now, after the Council of Revelations met last month on the 28th, we have a $2.3 billion deficit. And so uh, it's that big a, a guesstimate. And even the economists on the state council of revenues said that $2.3 billion estimate is only a guess. Mm -hmm. So we put a lot of money into the rainy day fund. Is that is that going to be sufficient or are we going to need to look for more funding to get us through this? Um, we expect that the money in the rainy day fund will be dispersed to various purposes. And that's the um, internal debate now occur. Certainly some of that money might go into further expenditures for UR, unemployment insurance, unemployment mm -hmm. claims. But there are a host of services and within state government that need help. In addition, of course, we have a large number of people in the private sector, as Representative Wildman was saying, that need help, or else they will face government pressure. And so that is about the of How much money do we need in terms of state government? The services, many of which are needed to help people get back to work, and how much money we spend outside. Well, I'm glad you guys are looking at this, and, and I know it's going to be a struggle to make it work. Now, we only have a minute left, so I wanted to ask you both about this um, this uh, uh, the, the police brutality, the police reform, not brutality. Police Reform Bill, House Bill 285, and Rep. Wildberger, do you have, what do you think of that? Do we need police reform? So um, I really do agree with the, the idea that um, we need more holistic policing. The uh, wholesale militarization of our police departments who does not serve our communities. And so um, I was disturbed to see multiple mayors looking to purchase something they call rapid response vehicles with their COVID CARES Act money. And I highly do not agree with that. Uh, I oppose the police, uh, the, the mayor spending any COVID funding on militarization of our police. And I do support disclosure and open transparency in uh, disciplinary issues with police officers. Pretty good. Rep Kobayashi, any comment on the police reform bill? I think be. that House Bill 285 will pass in one form or another and open up records, more sunshine about who has been disciplined, what charges, what consequences. Yeah, I think you're right. It's it's very interesting what to see what's been going on across the country. And I'm so happy that in Hawaii, our protests have been people and it seemed to bring people together rather than separate them. and and. The way they're looking at this, this bill, hopefully will do some positive reform for us. Okay, that's about all the time we have. Um, I want to thank you both for being here today. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and do this multi-island talk. So thank you for right. both for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. thank you, James. Thank you, Kikoa. Aloha, everybody. Have a great day. Okay. And you wear your mask. Once again next week. What was that? Everybody wear your mask. Okay, thank you. We'll wear our masks. Aloha, and thank you for watching. Very good. The legislature.